Now we'll discuss the interpretation of mass spectrometry data. And hopefully going through this process will really help underscore the usefulness of mass spect as well as some of the nuances of it that can help us answer some of the more tricky questions that might come up. So before we embark on this discussion, I think it's important to clarify one point that I made in a previous video. And that is that when you shoot the beam of electrons through your sample, a lot of times they can break bonds and things like that. So you get little fragments that have a plus one charge. But those electrons being shot through are high enough energy that they are capable of simply removing one electron from your molecular environment. And that's a useful point because that means that you can have every single atom that's in your molecule still be there and yet it will still have a plus one charge. And this becomes very important later on as we will discuss the molecular or parent ion. And the fact that you can produce a cation that has the exact same mass as your entire original compound is very, very useful in interpreting your mass spectrometry data. And so here, this isn't an exact illustration, but it's a representation of the mass spectrometry for glucose, which is C6H12O6. And we won't go through every one of these little peaks because that's not a very productive thing to do. But what we will do is we'll go through this piece by piece in order to understand some of the data that you can glean by looking at a mass spectrometry plot. And so we'll start out by going over the axes. And these are two very important things. The y-axis is the relative intensity. And what that means is if your little cationic component ends up hitting the receiver, that will record an event. But certain cations will be more common. For example, a methyl group might be common in something. Perhaps when we're dealing with glucose, you might find a hydroxyl group, an OH, being very common because there are a lot of potential hydroxyl groups, OHs, that you can make with glucose. And so you'll end up seeing a lot of events corresponding with the OH functional group there. Notice how many different groups there are. There are a lot of combinations and permutations of this. We could have a CH2OH set up. We could have a CH, CH2OH set up. There are a lot of different pieces you can make when you shoot a beam of electrons through and those beams of electrons are capable of making fragments like this. But whenever you're looking at any mass spec plot, your relative intensity is going to go from 0 to 100, where 100 is the most common event that you're recording. And you're going to have an x-axis of mass to charge, or m over z. And that tells you the relative mass of your charged cationic component that you've produced by shooting those electron beams through. And so the first one that we'll always be looking at is this one that is right next to zero. It's actually at a mass to charge ratio of one. And that corresponds with your proton, your H plus, that is only a proton. It doesn't have a neutron in the nucleus. So it's not deuterium, which has a mass of two. It's a proton, which has a mass of one. And the first event that you record at the lowest magnetic field is going to be very important for calibrating all of this data because this first peak that we see here will have a mass to charge of one and that will correspond to a proton and it has a mass of one AMU, one atomic mass unit. It corresponds with the mass of only a proton. Then as we move along, we'll see peaks at various other points. And we can look at the ratio of how high the mass to charge is over here versus that first one in order to figure out what the AMU of that component is. And so for example, if we have an OH group, remember that oxygen has a mass of 16 and the hydrogen or the proton here will have a mass of one. And so that will be at a mass to charge of 17. And so if you see events corresponding with a mass to charge ratio of 17, 
that will tell you that there is very likely going to be an OH group there because that is 17 times the mass of your proton here. Other groups that you can be aware of, but what, that you're probably not going to be responsible for interpreting directly on the MCAT might be something like a COO group. So something like this, and uh, now notice that it's not a COO minus anymore because we've created cations here. The COO group will have a mass of 12 for the carbon and 32 for the two oxygens. So you might see a peak at 44, and if you see a lot of peaks at 44, that tells you that the compound has a lot of COO groups in it. Glucose doesn't have a ton of those. It actually doesn't have any COO groups that are visible here. And uh, possibly we might be able to make one with a certain cleaving over here. But you're not going to see a tremendous amount of activity at 44 for the COO. There might be other pieces that show up at 44, but not many. But notice that all of these little peaks correspond with different pieces that you could be able to calculate by looking at the periodic table and the masses of the components. All of these things give us a little bit of information about what pieces we have in our compound. But there are only a few ones that are really relevant. An OH group that you'll see at 17, that's one that you might encounter a fair bit. This one at the far left that corresponds with the proton, that is very important. That's one that you use to calibrate everything else. There's one here at the very far right that might be the most important one in interpreting any mass spectrometry data. And that corresponds with what they call the molecular ion or the parent ion. It's what happens when your electron beam does only one thing. It steals an electron from somewhere in our molecule, but it doesn't get rid of any of the atoms. And so it creates a cation that has the exact same mass as our compound, but it has a charge and thus because it's a cation it can be used in mass spectrometry. This molecular ion or parent ion will be the one that is furthest to the right here. And for glucose, because it's C6H12O6 and those add up to around 180, for glucose, our parent ion or our molecular ion, or what we might call the parent peak or molecular peak, when we find that parent ion or molecular ion, that level will tell us how much mass the entire compound has. So that's a huge step in interpreting mass spectrometry data and finding out the identity of your unknown. And so this one, because it is at 180, that's its mass to charge ratio. Because it's at 180, that helps us realize that whatever our compound is that we're running the mass spectrometry for has an atomic mass of 180 AMU. And in order to figure that out, we needed to know what the mass to charge was of our smallest peak as well, which is just the proton, which has an atomic mass of 1 AMU. So whatever magnetic field it takes in order to curve it along that path, the magnetic field strength in order to curve the entire glucose that was turned into a cation, that will be 180 times as great as the magnetic field strength necessary to move just a proton along that curved path. So everything in mass spectrometry data is sort of normalized for the proton. If it's eight times as much field strength as the proton, that means it has eight AMU of mass. If it's 17 times, then it might be an OH group that has 17 AMU of mass for that particular, particular functional group. And so all of mass spectrometry cares about the field strength necessary to curve our very light proton so that it hits the receiver and our largest ion so that it hits the receiver. And then everything else in between can be used to figure out all of the little components and pieces that we could produce out of this glucose. And luckily on the MCAT, you're not going to have to be a mass spec expert. You're not going to have to be able to go in and interpret every one of these. And nowadays, a lot of it is, com is done by computers. But what you will need to do is you'll need to know the significance of the proton peak over here. 
You'll need to know the significance of the molecular ion or parent ion or molecular peak, parent peak. That is going to be important to give you the molecular weight of the entire molecule. And then you should probably know the significance of the mass to charge ratio, remembering that this is a function of how strong the magnetic field needed to be in order to produce a force that curved that cation around the path and let it hit the receiver. And remember that the larger or more massive that cation is, the more magnetic field strength was required in order to accelerate it around that path. And so as soon as you understand those core concepts, as soon as you realize that, for example, the mass is detected as a function of the strength of the magnetic field, and as soon as you realize that this peak here will be the peak of this entire compound turned into a cation, and perhaps also realizing that there are a few telltale ones, maybe a 15 mass to charge, which will be a methyl group, which has one carbon that is 12, and three hydrogens, which are three, for a total of 15. Realize that, for example, 15 will be a methyl group, 17 will be an OH group, maybe 44 will be a COO group. As soon as you realize that, and you understand the core principles of how mass spectrometry works, using a magnetic field to produce a force that will accelerate something proportional to its mass, once you understand that, then you'll be ready to tackle any of these questions when they come up on the MCAT, and you'll be able to answer questions very clearly when they show you a plot of the data. Maybe they'll ask you something about what compound could this be, and you'll be able to quickly see, well, if its molecular ion is 180, then it has to be something whose components add up to a mass of 180 AMU. So hopefully this clarified mass spectrometry, it's not a comprehensive discussion because you don't need to have a comprehensive understanding as much as you need to know the principles that are at work. How the electrons and their chemistry qualities relate to the physics that allows this moving cation to be curved around a path by a magnetic field and hit a receiver in a way that helps us interpret the data and figure out not only what compound we're dealing with because of that molecular ion, but also perhaps some of the other pieces like the OH group or the COO group that can help us deduce the exact structure of the unknown compound in our sample.